So, okay, we're past the 100 mark. I'm going to not look at that number because it's terrifying. Um, so let's just do a bit of uh, housekeeping before we get started. Today's webinar is nice and quick. It's scheduled to last about 30 minutes, including Q&A. Closed captions are available on the desktop and the mobile Zoom app. Just click the CC button to access those. And the lovely Amanda is providing those for us today. This webinar is being recorded and it'll be available on our website alongside additional resources within seven days. So do say hello in the chat. Make sure you select everybody from the drop down to make sure everyone can see. Uh, let us know uh, who you are, where you're from. And throughout the webinar, you can ask questions using the Q&A button. Uh, and you can also use the, react the reaction buttons as well. So today's webinar is what is audience data collection and why do you need it? So it's in our 101 series for beginners and those new to our subjects. It's going to be a very top level look at the subject. I only have about 20 minutes to talk today and it is a huge topic. There's a lot of detail that I won't have time to go into, um, but I will highlight a few things that might be useful for you. Um, a lot of people registering for the event have selected that they're sort of, they do a lot of audience research or, already or they're kind of more advanced. So um, I'm not sure what you're doing here, but hopefully there'll be some useful things for you as well. Obviously, a lot of you might have questions about Illuminate as well and how that's changing. Now, I'm not in the kind of proper Arts Council teams, so I can't really answer questions around that, but I might be able to answer questions at the end about how to get more surveys and things like that. So my name's Jack Roscoe. I'm the tech champion for audience data collection and evaluation. I'm a white man in my early 30s. Uh, I've got brown hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a white jumper. So I've spent about 10 years in audience research, um, working at Morris Hargreaves McIntyre and Acumen Fieldwork, and I've mostly focused on the creative and cultural sector for those 10 years as well. Um, joining me today, looking after the chat and managing your questions, we've got the wonderful Ollie, who's our tech champion for digital marketing strategy. So today we're going to cover three key topics. What is audience research? How do you do it? And why does it matter? So I've got an article on our Knowledge Hub, which gives an introduction to audience research, and it includes more about the practical side of it as well. Um, Ollie will give you a link to that in the chat. So what is audience research? Well, firstly, I should say it applies to any cultural and creative organization or individual. It's not necessarily just those based in a venue. You might be an individual artist, have a digital offer. You might be a festival or a library and think of your audience a bit differently. So whether people visit, watch, engage with you in a different way, that's fine. All of today's content will still apply, even if I use the word visit every now and then. So the goal is to find out about current audiences, those who currently visit, watch or engage with you, and potential audiences, um, those who aren't currently engaging with you at the moment, but hopefully they will one day, uh, and learning about them, and hopefully finding out some useful, actionable stuff that will actually help you in your day-to-day -day life. So the most common type of audience research is to look at your current audience and you're building up a profile of them in a number of ways. So how do they behave? And specifically, I mean to do with your offer and your program. So are they just coming for certain shows, works or activities or parts of your building if you're a venue based organization? When do they visit and how often? Why do they engage with you? What do they think of you and your offer? Who are they? And crucially, what would make them come back more often? So doing research about your current audience is designed to build up this overall picture. Once you've got some data about your current audience, you can look at it and notice if some people are missing. So for example, younger or older audiences, audiences who are disabled or neurodivergent, audiences from diverse ethnic or social backgrounds, or who engage with particular types of programming, and families with young children, or maybe you mostly get families and you don't see a lot of independent adults visiting. So if people from specific groups aren't showing up, maybe that's something you can then explore and try and address. So from your current audience data, you can make some inferences about who isn't in your audience. But current audience research only tells you half of the story, and it only really tells you about missing demographics in your audience. Some demographics do make a difference, 
uh, for your messaging and your programming, for example, families and younger audiences. And of course, we should be accessible and inclusive to everyone. And someone's background should never be a barrier for them feeling like they can engage with you or visit. But missing demographics don't really tell us about the underlying reasons for people participating or not participating and what might drive them. So other than demographics, just doing current audience research can't give you a detailed picture of the people who aren't currently engaging with you. So how might we start to think about your potential audience? Let's look at the whole market as one ecosystem. So Ollie's described the visual on this slide as an audience shallot, which I quite like. So your current audience are at the core of the shallot, people who've engaged recently, and usually that's within the last 12 months. But because of the slow returns of some audiences after the pandemic, as well as for some organizations where people may naturally attend less often, sometimes we might instead look at current visitors being within the last two years. The lapsed audience haven't engaged with you in the last one or two years, but they have done in the past. Then we move a bit further out to people who haven't visited or engaged with you. There are those who are aware of you, but have never visited or engaged. And then the unaware who don't know about you at all. So it's usually easiest to reach the people who are closest to you. Now at the moment, for various reasons, many organizations are struggling to maintain existing audiences, um, although recent data is showing that that's starting to recover. So retaining current audiences and encouraging lapsed audiences to visit again is often the biggest focus for that reason, as you've got some existing brand loyalty and currency with those groups. And pulling in new audiences is harder. And while it can especially take a lot of work to build your profile up amongst unaware audiences. But no matter who you're targeting, you need to equip yourself with the best data you can get to find the right strategy and tactics. So to research these potential audiences, the questions we ask are typically pretty similar to the current audiences I showed on the previous slide. Who would most likely engage with you? Are they already aware of you? And if they are aware of you, what do they think about you? What do they want? So what makes them tick when it comes to culture and similar offers to yours? Where can you reach them? I'm thinking about the effective use of marketing channels here. And most importantly, what would make them visit? Let's move on to how we do audience data collection. So there are four main steps to a research project. First, design the research, then collect the data, which we sometimes call in the research industry field work, analyze the results, and then make use of it. So the key is to think about the whole process when you're in the design phase. You don't want your list of survey questions to be really long. You want to ask your questions in a way that is simple to analyze. And as well, you want to think about the kind of data you and your colleagues would actually be able to act upon. So steps three and four is where my knowledge starts to end. For step three, the analysis, I can highly recommend my fellow tech champion, James Akers, who covers data analytics and insight uh, for support or resources. When it comes to step four, well, that's up to you and your colleagues. But depending on the findings of the research, you might want to speak to us at the Digital Culture Network about the things you've discovered, because it will feed into all of the areas that our tech champions cover. So there are two approaches to researching audiences and at the risk of sounding patronizing, you can either do it yourself or you can find someone else to do it. And you can always do a mix of the two. You could leave some tasks to yourself and you could get external freelancers or suppliers and services to do the rest. So let's think about how you might scope your research project and decide on that. When you're thinking about this, it's helpful to do an audit of your goals and your overall situation. The scale of a research project can vary massively from a simple five minute survey to a medium sized project that might involve a longer survey, maybe doing some additional methods on the side. Some larger research projects might look at multiple audience and non audience groups and combine different strands of research and data collection methods. So think about how many research objectives that you've got and how you can slim that down if possible. And how many groups do you want to research? Only the current audience for now, 
or do you want to research your potential audiences out there in the wild world as well? So how much time and budget do you have available, if any, and what's going to be realistic for you and your team on top of your other duties? Even a simple project could still take several days to do yourself, designing a survey, getting it out there, looking at the results. Larger projects could take weeks or even months, and they could take up a significant amount of your time as you design and structure them and try to keep all the plates spinning. Outsourcing could still take up some of your time as you need to tender and scope and agree everything with your suppliers, but on the plus side, you don't have to do the work. And in terms of cost, a simple project might cost you upwards of two or three thousand pounds to outsource to a freelancer to design and analyze a short survey. Freelancers will generally be a lot cheaper than working with agencies, but for a larger project, you might need an agency, or maybe you like the way that they analyze and present the data and the way that they see it. So you might be looking at around 15, 20, or even 30,000 pounds, depending on the size and scope of a research project. And that includes all of the design, the data collection, analysis, and reporting. As an alternative to commissioning full research projects, some agencies offer cheaper off-the-shelf products. So the audience agency have audience answers, and Morris Hargreaves McIntyre offer culture segments. And those are tools that are more affordable, and you can then implement them in your own DIY research. So thinking about tools and resources, what do you have on hand already? Do you already have a survey? Do you already have some recent audience research that tells you some of what you need to know? And are those existing tools and methods missing something crucial? Could you adjust and adapt them uh, to capture that and give you what you really need? And then finally, there's the knowledge and the skills that you and your team have. Are you comfortable thinking strategically about the research to design it? and how to create the surveys and tools, how to get enough people to answer them and collect your data. And will you be comfortable working with the data, analyzing it and understanding it for useful insights? External suppliers do bring all of these skills and they also have the added context of working more widely in the sector with other organizations and audiences. If you don't yet have the knowledge and skills, you might still have an ambition to develop them. And one of our favorite things at the Digital Culture Network is when people come to us and want to learn new skills and develop themselves. So could you learn what you need from our tech champions and our resources at the DCN or from other people in your network? So let's talk a bit about data collection methods. And there are two main categories of data collection. There's quantitative, which generates statistical data. Usually that's collected in large amounts to ensure it's accurate. For example, at least 150 or 200 surveys, or even more if possible. Qualitative methods are approaches that explore topics and themes in more detail. Usually that's done in a conversational way with spoken or written feedback, and then you pick through and identify stories and key ideas. Ollie has a link to an article where I discuss all of these data collection methods in more detail, which he'll post in the chat for you, so I don't have to go into them all here. Um, you probably will, most, most, many of you will be familiar with a lot of these anyway, and if not, you can read about them in that article. I do want to highlight three on this slide that might not be common knowledge and might be of interest. Panel surveying is something that is really easy to do yourself, and not many people working in our sector realize that. So my mission is to spread the word about panels. Panel surveying is when panel companies and suppliers send your survey to anonymous strangers on the internet. Sounds weird, but it is useful. You can reach the wider population and you can also fine tune and control the targeting of who it's sent to. So maybe that's people in your local area or people in a specific age group. Using panel surveys, you can do the potential audience research and that's exactly how research agencies do it. They use panels to get surveys from people who haven't engaged with you and even those who aren't aware of you. And you can set up and launch panel surveys directly on their platforms and they provide support and can help you through the process as well. In terms of cost, you might only be looking at about two pounds, three pounds per completed survey. So a couple of examples of trusted and user-friendly suppliers you could use are Dynata and Pure Spectrum. And Ollie will post some links in the chat for those if you want to investigate that. Uh, you might want to book one-to-one -one support with me as well if you're serious about doing panels. A second, uh, method that I think is really interesting at the moment is online communities. Um, these are becoming much more popular now as an alternative to focus groups. 
So they take place kind of by text in an online platform, sort of like Facebook or a WhatsApp group. Um, participants can respond and reply to different topics in their own time. And they can write messages and reply with pictures or emojis to research questions. So they can respond to the topic or materials that you post or to each other's comments and start tangential conversations that can be really interesting as well. So because it takes place um, asynchronously over time and people don't all have to be online at the same time, um, it takes away the stress of having to speak to everyone and get really interesting comments out of a really short focus group. So an online community method might run over a few days with two or three conversation topics per day. The most prominent platform for this is called Recollective, although others are available. And Ollie will link that one in the chat as well. Some people um, use platforms like Slack or Google Groups, which is a blast from the past. Um, to do it with a sort of DIY approach on a budget without paying the professional platforms for it. Finally, video ethnography is a relatively new method, which I think is really interesting. Uh, participants will do something and then they'll record videos of themselves, reacting to it and chronicling their thoughts uh, and the journey that they go on. So they might be exploring a venue or an exhibition, or they might be going on a visitor journey through a website or some digital content. Uh, one example I worked on was at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, where first time visitors sort of recorded um, their experience navigating the museum. And there's a sort of big spiral in the middle, which is really confusing. So it's interesting to get how people reacted to that. Um, they recorded their reactions as they explored the galleries and navigated the building. So video ethnography is usually done on commercial platforms. Um, a popular one is called Indemo. And on these platforms, you can structure a journey for a participant, like a trail of breadcrumbs for them to follow. Because it's a video recorded medium, you get in the moment responses from people and they feel really fresh and genuine. And sometimes people are very creative uh, and sort of inspiring. Um, you can use those video clips to help illustrate and bring your findings to life as well when you're presenting it to your colleagues and your board, you know, show them a video of someone reacting to a work. Um, not everyone will have the time to maybe use the, those methods, but I thought they might spark some interesting ideas for where the, you know, the market research sector is at right now um, and give you some ideas for other creative approaches. And if you've got budget, you could always mention them to consultants and suppliers and impress them with your knowledge. So how do we decide what we should ask about? It all links back to the core mission and strategy of your organization. You've laid certain things out as goals and impacts that you want to achieve. So your audience research should speak to those goals directly and tell you if you're delivering them and if you're not, how to do better. You should try and identify what your biggest unknowns are. You're looking for blind spots in your existing data and audience understanding. And you're ideally not asking something that you could already find out another way through your ticketing information or website analytics. And you're looking for the questions that are most likely to make an impact and be really useful for strategy or day-to-day -day work. And finally, the questions that you choose to ask will then give you the categories for you to group your audience and kind of put them into pots for analysis and insight, and ultimately for your marketing strategy. Um, that's what we talk about when we uh, talk about segmentation. And our default is often to group audiences by their demographics. Um, but as we mentioned, demographics often don't really define the characteristics of our audience. So putting audiences into groups to more easily understand them, we can turn them into the segments. Uh, segmentation is a method that identifies and categorizes key groups within audiences and tells us how to behave or how they behave and how to talk to them. You could do that on a simple basis by looking at their visiting habits. Maybe it's regular visitors and less regular visitors, um, types of programming people engage with. You could look at families and non-families, members or non-members, if that's really relevant to you. Some segmentation, and probably the best and most useful form of segmentation, is when it's based on deeper profiling. So the audience agency, for example, have their quite well-known audience spectrum um, segmentation, and that puts people into groups around their socioeconomics and how often they participate with culture and what kinds of culture they access. It's based on the postcode as well, so it's nice and simple to work with. Uh, Maurice Hargreaves McIntyre have a system called Culture Segments, 
which uses a set of golden questions to segment people by their psychology. So it groups them by their underlying needs and their motivations when it comes to culture. So it's easy to talk to them and kind of understand what messages they might want to hear. Uh, these segments can be integrated back into your customer record system and your mailing list. And then that can inform your approach to things like print or email marketing, among many other uses. So it's a really big topic and it can be a tough nut to crack for almost all organizations. Um, so that might be something to reach out to us and book in one-to-one -one support if you want to explore that. So thinking about specific questions you can ask. Um, on this slide, I've listed a few examples of the basic questions in a survey. Um, mostly these are more appropriate for current audiences. And it's all the basic stuff I talked about before, the behavior, how often they visit, um, how they discovered you and marketing channels, pricings, and various ratings that you could ask for. If you're based in a venue or you work in public spaces, distance traveled is really useful because you can not only identify environmental impact, but also discover how well you're doing with national audiences, regional and local, and even hyper-local audiences as well. Um, I wouldn't advise you to chuck in all of these questions or you'd have a really long survey. So when you're planning a survey, think about which ones of these will actually be really useful to you. And what will your colleagues and yourself be able to act or work differently based on? Um, or can you capture these things from somewhere else outside the survey? And then one final question that I really like and that I think is particularly useful to frame everything else is to ask about people's motivations for engaging with you. So on the screen, there's a long list of answer options. You could make that shorter as well. Um, but even then, to make it more manageable for you to uh, look at and analyze, you can group these statements into different categories. So you can see that on the right here. Um, social categories, it's more about fun and entertainment, sharing experiences with others. Intellectual, maybe more about learning and engaging with a subject. And with emotional, we're starting to think about engaging on a deeper level and having a sort of response to what they've seen. And for spiritual, we're thinking about the work as a kind of mirror that inspires people to reflect or to have some kind of transcendent or self-actualization experience when they see the work, which sounds pretty far out, but that's um, that's obviously what you would love to achieve with any work. Um, so looking at it using these specific categories was developed by Maurice Hargreaves McIntyre. Um, there's a number of ways that they use them in their analysis of visitor surveys. So there's a copyright um, logo at the bottom. I have checked this with them. Um, if you're a creative and cultural organization or an individual and you're doing your own audience research, um, there isn't really any reason you can't use this question yourself and categorize these this way. Um, but I would maybe not copy it if you're a commercial research supplier. Um, asking questions like this, you can see what audiences' expectations are of you. So you can see which concepts might be getting through in the marketing and which ones particularly resonate. Asking the motivations by themselves is useful. But you can ask a second question afterwards um, to ask about what which of these they experienced as outcomes, asking them in the same list again, but in the past tense. And when you can compare the original motivation against the outcome that they actually had, you can follow the journey that audiences go on. So did they come expecting one particular kind of experience and they got what they wanted? Did they just come for a social visit, but then they ended up engaging on a much deeper level? Or the reverse, they expected something deep and moving, but didn't experience it. So you can identify what's happening to visitors between the beginning and end of the experience. And I really like this question because it, it tells a story. And the best part is it's data driven. So you get the answers as percentages. And if you get enough surveys, you can track that over time. You can look at them by different segments um, for different events and different bits of programming. Finally, and we're running a bit short on time here, um, why does audience data collection matter? So I want to return to something I mentioned at the start. Um, there's no point in doing any of this if the data that you collect, analyze and interpret uh, doesn't lead to useful and actionable insights. And that means sharing the insight right across the organization from front of house to operations, uh, marketing, and making sure it benefits everybody. You want to be collecting data that is surprising. It gives you a clear direction on changes. It shows you what is and isn't working, and it informs your marketing messages and priorities. Data is your friend. So it helps you understand the state of play. It supports your decisions, and it gives you the evidence that you need to argue with your boss or your funders. 
It feeds into evaluations and it lets you monitor change over time. And it's crucial for commercial survival. It helps you retain and grow your audience. It helps you to discover what makes your current audience tick and speak their language to bring in more people. And it helps you identify new opportunities amongst lapsed and potential audiences. So that's it. That's the end of the quick introduction to audience data collection today. Um, you can explore that in more detail. There's more on this topic uh, on our Knowledge Hub on the Digital Culture Network's website. Um, Ollie will share an article that many of you might find useful at the moment, um, Top Tips for Collecting Surveys. Uh, you can get specific and personal support from us as well and book in a one-to-one. -one. Um, so these are the places you can find us uh, and get in touch with us. And as a reminder, you can get completely free and unlimited one-to-one -one support from us if you need help with this or any of our other specialisms. So we have probably space for about two questions. I'll, Ollie can come in lightning fast and see if I can answer any. Hey, Jack. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. And yeah, I know we're short on time. Just quickly, a, a question came in from Jenny uh, Keynes. Can you expand a bit on the one-to-ones, please? Format, cost, et cetera. Uh, one-to-ones with us, or? I believe so. Uh, they're free. <laughs> they're completely free, um, which people never believe when I say. Um, you can book in on our website and you'll be directed to the appropriate champion, um, depending on the kind of nature of your problem. So we cover all sorts of digital specialisms. Um, yeah, like everything you might want to do with marketing, websites, platforms, IT, data, everything. And it's we have a chat with you online or we can email back and forth and you can keep coming back to us over and over again. And it's absolutely free. Um, so do 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 that. Thanks, Jack. Um, okay, uh, one from Jenna in the Q&A. Do the online communities represent a range of demographics? Can you ensure this? Yeah, so um, usually someone will recruit people to take part in that. So that's the platform, but the recruitment process is up to you. Um, people will often go to fieldwork agencies who find participants to take part. Um, that's usually about 75, 80 quid a person. So you might want to just do it yourself. Uh, in which case, maybe that's going on Facebook and and sort of maybe you have a quota sheet to sort of make sure you're getting people from diverse backgrounds. You know, you're getting people from um, all of the characteristics that might matter uh, right across the board to make sure the people in that online community represent your community. Excellent. Um, this, this question came up a, a quite a bit in the chat. Um, will the slides and the links in the chat be available after the call? Do you just want to explain about what happens post post webinar, Jack? Yes. Well, so it's already happened. It's it's they're already in your email inbox. I think maybe a day or two ago. Um, there will be a a part of our so this webinar will be listed on our website as well in the knowledge hub, and you'll be able to access everything there: a video, the slides, um, and kind of any other resources that we've linked to as well. But do look in your email inbox, and it should already be there. Okay, great. And the, and and uh, someone here, I forget the name. I'm sorry. But uh, they asked if possibly we could include links uh, around the project you you did with Guggenheim. Is that is that possible? Is that is that? Important? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, these things aren't always um, the reports aren't always public because it's sort of commercial market research. So I'll dig into that one and see if that's available. We'll include it if so. Okay. Um, you. you might not be able to see the videos potentially, but maybe you will. Um, but there are, there's loads of good stuff out there. Um, the British Museum is a really good repository for case studies as well. They they all of their exhibitions they have a full report of the market research that they did and current and potential audiences on there, and it's really visual. There's loads of models, loads of pictures. Um, so if you can check out the British Museum's evaluation page if if there's nothing else available. Do we have time for one more, Jack? It's half two. <laughs> well, people can just leave, right? I'll, I'll answer one more. Okay, cool. Uh, a question from Andy here. How long approximately does the data collection process take? Uh, so how long is a piece of string? It's, um, it depends on how long the survey is, what your method is, uh, how many how many surveys or sample size you want to achieve. Um, if you are collecting a survey and firing out on the internet, maybe that's two, three weeks, something like that. Maybe it's a, a kind of a current audience research is often a long-term thing. You have an audience survey and it just keeps on going, um, to recruit for qualitative methods like focus groups, um, and the online communities. Maybe that's, you know, if you're working with a commercial supplier to recruit people for you, maybe that's sort of two, three weeks. 
Um, I always like to give them more time because it's a really stressful industry to work in. Um, so if you can give them six weeks, I'm sure they'd appreciate that. <laughs> nice. Good, good insight. Um, let, we've got one more here, so let's just tackle that and then we'll call it a day. Uh, question from Joe. Um, is it better to pursue further insights into demographics or demographic that is already engaged to maximize that relationship or to study a range of groups to create a broader audience? I think it depends on who you are and what your offer is, but I think it, it sort of, it often makes sense to do both, which is such a cop out, but you can easily find, you know, you've got a current audience and you can kind of profile them and see, right, who are our normal people? Like, what do we normally get? And if you can find more of them and reach them, then that's an easy win to bring in more people. But uh, we obviously are in a situation where we would love arts and culture to reach more people. Um, and maybe as a sort of way for organizations to future-proof themselves and, and sort of transform what they do, reaching new communities and new audience groups um, is really important. And, you know, you see that with age as well as everything else, like audiences getting older. And how are you going to bring in new people to make sure your organization lasts, you know, 50, 60 more years? Um, yeah. So do what really works for your current audience and get more of them. But if you can identify really good opportunities and events and programming and language that will bring in new audiences, then go for it. Brilliant. Cool. Jack, that was excellent. Um, we, yeah, we are at time now. So let's, let's call it a day. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for attending, everybody. <laughs> Have a lovely day. Take care of yourselves.